Welcome to the Wind of the Tao podcast. I'm your host, David Marshall. And as Confucius said, She er shi si zhi bu yi ye hu. You peng zong yan fang lai bu yi le hu. Or as Lao Tzu put it, Dao ke Dao. And St. John also, Kai Alogos Sarx Egeneto. <laughs> Sorry if that's confusing, but... I got as, the last one. <laughs> as Mary Poppins put it all. Let's see, where's Mary Poppins? Here we go, Mary Poppins. Hey, hey Mary Poppins. Yeah. Here. Here. Where? Here. I never explain anything. Now, how do I get out of here? Huh? What? 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 Well, I don't always explain everything. Sometimes I explain a few things, but we also have guests here to explain things, and that's why we're uh, very pleased and honored to have Dr. Wynne Corduan from uh, Taylor University, although you're retired now, aren't you? Right. Hello, David. Thank you for having me on your show. Yes, and uh, Dr. Corduan is a specialist in the philosophy of religion. Now, what exactly does that mean? What is a philosopher and what is a religion? Well, those are interesting questions for sure. Let me give you a definition of religion. I would say it's something like this. It's a system of beliefs and actions that try to put us into contact with something that's transcendent, i.e. beyond the world in which we usually live. And there are a lot of things that can be transcendent, God or spirits or whatever else one may think of and uh, a religion tries to come up with ways in which you can make contact with the specific thing that is real and thereby improve your life be saved for the afterlife or just uh, keep evil forces at bay. So that would be religion in my point of view. Philosophy. Now, well, is, let's, talk, let, let's talk a little bit about religion, first of all, because there are a lot of different definitions of religion. Mm -hmm. And I believe it was Peter Berger talked about, the sociologist, uh, Peter mm -hmm. Berger talked about uh, two different categories of religious definitions. One was, I think, functional. I don't remember the other word he used for the other one. Basically, the idea was, do you look at what one believes or do you look at the, the function or purpose of, of religion in society? Um, your definition, it would seem to be, uh, leans more towards, well, it's a little hard to say exactly. Would you describe, say, uh, Marxism as a religion or not? Uh, I would not. But uh, let me hedge on that a little bit. First of all, about Peter Berger, we certainly can divide <clears throat> different religions into different categories underneath that big umbrella. Okay, I gave you a big umbrella definition. Now, there's all kinds of uh, subcategories you can get out of that functional one or belief one, or you can think in terms of religions that promise salvation and religions that are simply for the here and now and so forth. So uh, there, there are different subcategories. Now, Marxism can be a religion, but if you take it in the sense in which Karl Marx meant it, it wouldn't be because it tries to deal only with the imminent rather the transcendent. It talks about what is going to happen with the working class, the proletariat, 
the future, but it's all in terms of a material, physical, economic kind of pattern. Of course, in a number of places, uh, the leader, the political leaders, uh, you know, most notably Ma Zetong uh, and uh, others, Lenin in Russia, have taken on pretty much the job of a deity. And when you look at it in that way, uh, then... Uh, Kim Il-sung, most, most obviously. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> I mean, everybody who lives in North Korea is a member of his uh, religion. Well, I, I, gave, I gave Rodney Stark a little bit of pushback on this, and I know definitions of words are somewhat arbitrary. You can define any word any way you like in theory if you, if you make it clear what you mean, I think. Um, but it seems to me that functionally, the way Marxism and communism actually serves, works in society, it's just very much the same as any other uh, religion, which, you know, whether it's imminent or transcendent, it seems to be to work to function as, as uh, very much as a, a religion and, and the whole, the, the scriptures, um, the saints and, and, and sacrifice and all those kinds of ideas seem to come into those. So I, I guess it's arbitrary which, which way you take the definition, but. Uh, yeah, it certainly has a cultus as most religions do. In fact, they have to have one to be a real religion. I mean, they certainly have life outlined for you. This is what you must do. These are the persons you must respect. Uh, this is what you must believe and so forth. So it comes very close to being religion. And uh, maybe, I mean, I'm not sure what depends on defining it that way. Maybe I'll change my mind. <laughs> we still have the same pattern. So also, also, I mentioned the word philosophy. What, yeah. How do you see philosophy? Well, philosophy it depends on the philosopher, of course, and that was a cheap answer. So uh, philosophy is a rational approach to life with or without transcendence. Uh, it's a way of analyzing the things we say, the things that we do. Uh, philosophy takes a step back frequently from commitment to something transcendental. Uh, I like to go with Aristotle's definition of metaphysics that for, uh, philosophy or metaphysics is the study of being qua being, or let's say what exists and what kind of thing it is that exists, how we react to it, how we express it, and so forth. So your goal is to systematically understand religions, in other words. Yeah, when I do philosophy of religion, much of the time I look for the philosophical background behind what people practice. Uh, we all, when we do theology or practice religion or whatever, have philosophical assumptions underneath of uh, how we express the religion. Now, as Christians, we like to say that all our beliefs are based on the Bible and that's good, but when we start to tell people what the Bible says, then we're using concepts that aren't directly found in the Bible. Uh, so what, and you've written quite a few books. How many books have you written? Uh, depends on how you count it, co-authorship, editions, and so forth, about 10. Okay, and... Uh, the book, the only one of those 10 books that I've read is In the Beginning God. So that's probably where our conversation is going to concentrate today. Okay. But is there anything, any other book that you want to give a little blurb for that you think is, is overlooked and, and that is particularly, so what are you working on now? What is your. Um, okay, I'm working right now on 
a third edition of my uh, religious textbook, Neighboring Faiths, Introduction, Christian Introduction to World Religions. Which seems to be your most popular book. It is. On Amazon. Yeah. God has blessed that one very much. And, uh, and uh, then I want to work on a book on formal logic, which is something that I've played around with for a couple of decades now, and I have some things written. But totally aside from religions and so forth. Well, that's part of philosophy. So it's, I guess that would still mm -hmm. be part of your body wick. Um, primitive monotheism is the idea that the original societies, the original uh, groups of people, bands of bands of little bands of humanity, uh, were aware of God, knew, knew God, knew something about God, and, and worshipped God. Uh, how, is it, would you define it something like that, or how would you? Yeah, would something you like it? that. That uh, the religion of the earliest human beings, by which I mean Homo sapiens, uh, the religion of the earliest Homo sapiens was a monotheism in the sense of believing in one God who created the world, who lives in the sky, who has certain moral precepts that he expects human beings to follow. Now, actually, you say he created the world, but according to both Schmidt and your own and yourself, creation is not necessarily a part of what many primitive peoples believed about God or knew about God. Yeah, it's a it's a common feature. It's not necessarily there. Sometimes he delegates the creation to someone else. Sometimes there is a uh, a chaos. So something already exists in terms of Western philosophy, and he just shapes what is there. Yeah, in, in Chinese tradition, um, this is not the most clear aspect of, of Shangdi or of Tian in the, in the earliest text, but you do get in, in, there is one poem in the Book of Poetry that is, that is entitled uh, Tian Zhou Ren, Zhou Shan, Zhou Shan, Heaven Created the, the Mountains or the Mountain or something like that. And then there's also a little bit in the, uh, um, the Ming Dynasty where the emperor would come and worship the supreme god, there seems to be very creation-oriented. But in general, generally speaking, there's not quite as much about creation in, in the original Chinese theism as there is. Yeah, well, I don't know. It depends on how far back you go. I mean, just because there's a high god or supreme god in the culture doesn't mean that they have retained what may have been an original belief because the, the whole pattern is, and I don't want to retroactively ascribe anything without, to any religion without uh, having the evidence, but uh, the pattern is that you have the original single God, and then people turn to spirits, imagine other gods, and so forth, and then you have a process of degeneration, and so... Uh, and, and that seems to be very much what St. Paul was talking about in Romans and also in Acts. Um, David Hume, in his very amateurish anth anthropology of religions, uh, he believed that if the, if the Greeks couldn't come up with theism, he was kind of, a, I guess, a kind of a deist of some sort. And he believed that if the Greeks couldn't come up with so exalted a theory as, as monotheism, then nobody else could because everybody else was such barbarians by compared to the comparison to the Greeks. But St. Paul seemed to get the idea that there was God in primitive cultures. And also uh, St. Augustine, I believe in the city of God, he also talked about... Uh, he kind of predicted that going out in, in north, south, east, and west, you would find some traces of a, of a monotheistic mm -hmm. idea. So the Christian idea of monotheism, how, how would you, how would you see, describe the history? I mean, we usually talk about Andrew Lang as the 
the keynote speaker in this conference, the person who really brought the idea of primitive theism back in, onto the onto the stage. How how would you see the see his role in in the Christian theory of primitive monotheism? Okay, there there were several questions there. Uh, let me uh, just quickly address the Greek situation. Uh, the uh, main god, the chief god in the Greek pantheon was Zeus or Zeus Pater, Father Zeus. And then uh, if you move over to Rome, you have Jupiter. And there's definitely a language relationship to it. In India, you have Deus Peter, and all of those are supreme gods who at one time were at least the highest god, and uh, more likely than not, the god from which the pantheons developed. Now, Andrew Lang came uh, from the other side of things, Excuse me. Looking at the religion of the Australian tribes and other tribes, and he came to the conclusion that you could find tribes that were monotheistic. That is, they only had one god, even though you know. Don't think in terms of all the attributes of the God of the Bible but there was one and only one God. Then there were other cultures where they were in what we call an animistic phase. They believed in a lot of spirits and there may have been a God part of that culture. There may still be remnants of it. And so Andrew Lang, uh, basing himself on the uh, anthropological work of A.C. Howitt said, we can't get away from the fact that there are some uh, tribes who have a religion, who worship a single supreme God, and there's no way that we have any evidence that it evolved out of an animism. But there was a flip side to it, there were other tribes where there was animism. And as I just said, there may be a vestige, a memory of a single God, but basically he's not there any longer at their disposal. And uh, Lang could not say which of the two would be earlier in terms of representing what human beings believed and worshiped right after they originated. And so that's where Lang left us hanging, so to speak. He was very much in favor of there being some tribes that were apparently monotheistic, some that were animistic, who comes first. And right. Well, a Andrew Lang is an interesting character for a lot of different reasons. I mean, oh, yeah. you find his you find his uh, collections of fairy tales still in, in libraries, uh, different mm -hmm. colored red, the red book of fairy tales or whatever color it is. Yeah. Uh, do you have any idea what his personal beliefs were? Uh, he was into the occult, uh, seances, spiritism, that kind of a thing. Uh, he said uh, he liked the Australian high gods better than Jehovah of the Bible. He began with as the most outstanding uh, student and disciple of a e. Tyler who uh, uh, who was an atheist, and uh, he really promoted the idea of the evolution of religion. And animism. And animism as the, the basis, yeah. And, uh, well, Tyler eventually split from that, but uh, 
he had so many interests. Uh, after writing The Making of Religions and a couple of other things, like you said, he went back to fairy tales and uh, folklore and all kinds of other things. The Speaking of Australia, I did want to ask about that because uh, in my book, the, the Truth Behind the New Atheism, which was written in 2007, I was, I think, the second response to Richard Dawkins and some of the other new atheists. Uh -huh. And and I challenged Daniel Dennett's uh, theory of how religion evolved. And I, I mentioned the uh, high God hypothesis and I, I, I endorsed it, which I still do. Uh -huh. um, then a, what do you, what would, how would I want to describe him? Uh, a fellow by the name of um, Hector Avalos at Iowa State University or Iowa University, I don't, I don't remember which, he's, he's recently deceased. He is a very harsh critic of, of religion in general and Christianity in particular. And he, uh, I had challenged some of his writings. So he challenged, he, he bought my book apparently. And then he attacked me in very visceral, and and rather nasty terms but the only thing that he criticized it seemed was this one footnote that i had mentioning durkheim and durkheim had mentioned Howitt, i believe or somebody else in australia and he crucified that not really my footnote but a footnote of a footnote <laughs> uh which i thought was you know quite a in some ways a very impressive use of his considerable considerable abilities to go after me in that way in a very obscure so how how far uh how far i guess it was more the the, the question of how far how common this sort of idea of a high god was in australia do you have any idea in terms of which tribes and what percentage of the australians had that sort of an idea Oh, I don't have a percentage, and I, I could read to you all the names of the tribes, but the ones that we're talking about that have this real monotheistic view are the ones that you would have found in the southeastern part of Australia. And they are mostly gone now. When you get further uh, west and north, you get tribes that are much more uh, developed materially and their religion is also much, much more complex with their initiation ceremonies and uh, that's, beliefs that's, and so forth. That's an interesting connection, which you bring up and, and, and uh, Wilhelm Schmidt brings up as well, but I'm not sure, and, and Rodney Stark also does, the, the relationship between development of culture and uh, the, like the Salish, you mentioned the Salish in uh, in North America, yes. Indian, Indian peoples who, there's the coastal Salish and then there's a the Salish that live more in the Spokane area or Idaho mm -hmm. or somewhere around there, mm -hmm. I'm not exactly sure where, but the inland, the inland Salish, they had a harder life they didn't yeah. have as much to eat and and it was a little harder to make a living but on the coast you could you know develop a very complex culture in which which they did mm -hmm. so it's interesting to me that you focus your in your you talk about the the inland salish as as having a, a preserving a more clear idea of the supreme god yeah i was of course reporting on uh schmidt's ideas and uh, his conclusions but yeah, look, the history of humankind is a history of migration. Mm -hmm. And you're going to find the people who most closely represent what early human beings must have been like in places where people with a more highly developed culture would not particularly want to live. So you find it in those desert areas of Australia. You find them in uh, Tierra de Fuego. You find them in 
on the North Pole, uh, in the steppes of Africa, uh, in the not so inhabitable land in the Americas. And so there, there is a correlation by the, or at least we uh, assume one, that the people who are uh, least developed materially are going to demonstrate the least developed form of religion, and that turns out to be a monotheism. Well, that seems to fit well with St. Paul's anthropology in, in the book of Romans, mm -hmm. where he talks about, you know, the corruption that comes in with, with uh, mm -hmm. worship of idols and whatnot. Um, so let's talk a little bit about Wilhelm Schmidt, who is the major figure in your book. Yeah, uh, he's the one who made it all go. Like I said, Andrew Lang came up with a two-headed conclusion. And uh, it's interesting, Rodney Stark has a, a chart in one of his books that shows various tribes, and there's a long chart, which are monotheistic, which are not. Yes, yes. And now, how do you decide which is the most... Uh, Discovery close, of God. Closest to the... Okay. Uh, the closest to what may have been the religion of the uh, earliest humans. And so, to that end, Schmidt used the so-called cultural historical method. And uh, it's in German, it's the uh, uh, Kulturkreis or culture circle methodology. And the point of it is to try to arrange a sequence of the relative ages of various tribal cultures with regard to each other. Well, a sequence seems to imply a line rather than a circle. Uh, well, for example, the Salish, you have, mm -hmm. they seem to belong to the same culture, but one group is, is more prosperous than the other. And, and uh, it, according to this, as far as I can understand it, um, you begin with the less developed belief in the supreme god and then as the culture develops and, and, and becomes very prosperous then for some reason or another it seems to lapse from that so uh, can you explain the idea of a cultural circle and how it relates to you yeah. know that sort of example yeah i'm not sure what to do with the, the sailors specifically uh, the circles represent waves okay peoples migrate and uh, so they come out of Africa, according to the present uh, opinions. And so some people leave and find better places to live. And uh, their culture is very well developed. It doesn't need to be because they don't have any competitors at first. But then another wave of people leaves Africa and they have better weapons and uh, are more advanced materially. And so they can't come into that region. And uh, the first wave people get displaced or move on. Sometimes they pick up the, uh, the culture of those of the latecomers, sometimes they get eliminated. Sometimes uh, the new culture picks up some traits that belong to the older culture. So it's not easy when you look at the particular situations or so it would seem. Then again, it's not that hard to tell a culture that has 
only sharpened wooden spears with ones that have uh, some kind of metal tips, a culture that only has woven baskets compared to cultures that have pottery. Cultures. So part of it's, so part of it's historical and part of it's defined historically and part of it's defined uh, according to, uh, you know, what sort of archeological objects you, you, you find in that culture. It's, yeah, it's, it's not economic, an economic basis. Uh, yeah, it's not ex actually archaeology. I mean, it's we call it an ethnology, uh, and it's. Uh, I mean, you only have the present to look at. You know, the present contains remnants of the past, but uh, you know they're not artifacts in the sense of older things. They're things that people use in the present. Uh, the term that Schmidt used was forms of the culture. Mm -hmm. so, now, the problem with about Schmidt for a lot of English readers is it seems there's only two of his books that have been translated. Uh, and he has thousands of pages apparently in German, which I personally do not read. So uh, I, I assume you've read quite a bit of the, uh, the German text. <laughs> yeah, uh, I have some exhibits here. Uh, the Ursprung der Gottes Idee, Volume 1, and that goes through Volume 12, and uh, it's pretty imposing. Let me yeah. say something about that, though. Uh, when that first came out, okay, I'm talking about Volume 1 now, it was a series of articles in a journal. The journal called Anthropos. Now it was written in French, but uh, you, and it's not been translated to the best of my knowledge. But you know, back then in the 1930s, it would not have been all that hard for people to read what he wrote. Then it was published in book form, about 400 pages in French. Uh, something that a scholar should be able to do, perhaps. Then it was translated in German and grew in uh, numbers of pages. And it was a long time before volume two of that came out. In the meantime, he published uh, The Origin and Growth of Religion, which was a summary of his conclusion so far. And in German, it's just a you know, 280 pages. And then the others followed. Uh, so what I'm saying is uh, you may not want to get back in time and read the, uh, the original German or even French because that you're not an anthropologist, uh, though you have a lot of interest in it. But when you have people who call themselves anthropologists saying, oh, Schmidt wrote so much, we don't have time to read all that German, uh, that really doesn't help very much. That's really not very convincing because you can start with the beginnings, which were not in German, and which were pretty uh, short. Also in English, we have a description of his method, the culture historical method of ethnology. And uh, I don't know if I have it here. Well, uh, a book of uh, general on general revelation. So there's, there's plenty available in English. Yeah, well, I, I've, I've read some of the English stuff. Um, you you conclude that Schmidt stands not unscathed, but unrefuted. Can you explain what you mean by that? Yeah, uh, his work 
has been superseded in some ways. Uh, he, his uh, fundamental belief was that religion, uh, that human beings were first created, and he did believe in creation, in China, for example. And uh, that caused all kinds of problems because in China, once you have the pastoral nomads, they have horses. Uh, and then in Africa, you have pastoral nomads whose culture is not as evolved as it were, or developed, I should avoid the word evolution, whose culture, culture seems to be lower material than that of the Chinese. They don't have horses to ride on, among other things. Well, the Chinese didn't have horses uh, in the very early, and they had to get horses from the, from Central Asians, I believe. Yeah, um, yeah no, let me, let me put it this way. Once we have now realized that actually the origin of Homo sapiens is in Africa, right? then it really makes sense. In Africa, they don't have horses yet. Then as we move to Asia, Central so, Asia, and China. Yeah, so, so, so there are some big pictures, pieces of the, of the puzzle that, Sh that Schmidt had no way of, of knowing at that time. Right. Um, now, the, the reference you talk, you mentioned uh, Starks breaking down, you know, what different kinds of primitive peoples had what beliefs uh, is in Discovery of God. And, and, and the way he okay. puts it there is that nomadic peoples, 42% um, had an active belief in God and 23% had a inactive belief, or I'm sorry, 22%. And then a very a slash and burn agriculture and, and much gathering. He broke early peoples down into these different categories and then he gave a percentage not him it wasn't from himself he borrowed it from somebody else yes right uh and and that's a different sort of a system uh from what schmidt seems to you you you, you say that stark's analysis of that is a little uh, simplistic perhaps well like like many scholars they stop with andrew lang because they for whatever reason because they haven't read schmidt or because they have some other kind of fundamental disagreement with them. They don't take cognizance of Schmidt and the culture historical method. And so, uh, you know, it's not about percentages. It's about matching the cultures with the least developed environment with their religion. So uh, I want to know if there are 50 tribes that don't believe in God, in a single God, what is the level of their culture on the whole? If you have two tribes that believe in a single God, what is the level of their culture and it's, how, how confident can we be, do you think, of a lot of the early reports of what some of these tribes believed? Uh, quite confident. Uh, the, uh, <clears throat> the discoveries, many of the first archaeological reports came from non-believers, atheists, people who saw it as their mission to discredit so-called primitive religion and thereby all religion. Uh, let me mention a couple of examples, if I may. One uh, in Australia, A.C. Howitt uh, was, well, at the time, everybody was an amateur uh, anthropology was just becoming a, a scholarly field. Uh, 
and uh, he visited a lot of tribes. His background, his basic uh, philosophy came from Augustus Morgan, who uh, believed that uh, human beings began with group marriage and, uh, you know, not even recognizing parents and their children and so forth. And he wanted to instantiate that. In the process, he came across various tribes who uh, believed in one single God. And uh, that was a real thorn in the flesh to E.B. Tyler. Now, E.B. Tyler was the figure at the end of the 19th century in uh, the evolution of religion. And uh, he wrote a two volume uh, work called uh, Primitive Culture, excuse me. And it was his job at times at the Royal Anthropological Society to read the papers from people who came from abroad, such as A.C. Howitz. Now, when Tyler first learned about uh, the apparent monotheism in Australia and in America, There were people who said, hey, wait a minute, that there's obviously the influence of missionaries at work. These missionaries have brought their message of one God and all these tribal people are buying into it. And uh, uh, Tyler then said, no, no, no. Uh, these are original uh, developments in the evolution of religion. So, for example, the Algonquin tribes have belief in God, and they got it from uh, the missionaries who weren't there yet, but who had been on the East Coast. Somehow they heard of it and adopted it to themselves. And so I have a quote here, which... I wanted to share with you, here's the book, and I don't know if I can find the quote now. Uh, anyway, he says that uh, the missionaries society yeah, is, does not work at all. Uh, it's, uh, this is part of the natural development. But then in the second edition, all of a sudden, he reverts back to the missionary thesis because it cannot be proven yeah. that the monotheism was uh, developed from the animism. And so he simply, without explaining why or anything, all of a sudden says, no, they got that from the missionaries. Yeah. All the arguments that he used against that. Yeah, it's interesting, uh, Tyler, uh if you go into the Anthropology Museum in Oxford, uh, he, he has a couple of uh, totem poles, which he uh -huh. contributed to that museum from uh, from from British Columbia here in here in our area. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, now, you also talk a little bit about Africa, and I'm not I'm not, I'm not an Africa scholar, but let's talk, touch on that just for a moment. Um, you have some Christian theologians and, and, and scholars like uh, Kwame Bediako and, and I think Laman Sane, I'm not sure how, how his name is pronounced, at, at Yale University, who seem to be very interested in the idea of, of God, but especially John Mbiti, who wrote a book in which I think two or three chapters are all about the idea of God in different African cultures. But you you say he he's a little bit too enthusiastic and, and, and pro probably goes a little bit beyond the evidence in some of his arguments. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a unusual kind of argument that he presents. Many African tribal religions have a high God, 
Some of them worship him directly on a daily basis, like the Maasai, others such as the Kukuyu, uh, worship him only in times of emergency. But there's usually a high god somewhere in the history of the culture. Now, Mbiri says that uh, actually there's a high god behind all African religions, but some people practicing these religions don't know it. They, they only know to venerate the ancestors and other spirits, but uh, they, they are not even really aware, aware of the high god. Nevertheless, the ancestors are immediate um, are mediators between the people and God. And so when they do worship the ancestors, they unwittingly worship the high God as well. And uh, as uh, Richard Gaiman said, uh, that goes beyond the reasonable. People don't worship someone of whom they don't have any clue. I mean, if maybe you, the altar to the unknown God. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> an acknowledged agnosticism rather than a, an implicit agnosticism. Maybe that's the difference there. Okay. Um, so, uh, what was I thinking? Well, yeah, usually people who talk about high gods in Africa usually focus on the pygmies and, 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 and some other tribes, yeah. but it's fairly, it's fairly widespread though. Yeah, the pygmies and. Uh, the uh, San people, again, we have people out on the fringe displaced by uh, materially superior cultures and uh, they believe in only one God. Now, let's not forget that we believe in angels and demons and uh, so do Jews and Muslims. Yeah. And so uh, there may be other spirits. Yeah, the, the, the distinction is very clear in Chinese between, at least in ancient Chinese, between the Shangdi and the Guishen. Um, now you, both Schmidt and yourself, uh, spend quite a bit of time uh, replying to some of the leading theorists of religion as well. And, uh, you know, people like, Radin, who is an anthropologist of, of, of uh, North American religions mm -hmm. and a friend, apparently for a while, at least he, he, he was uh, very open to uh, so the high God. And Mircea, forgive me if I mispronounce his name because I only ever read it. I never try to say it. Mircea Eliade, mm -hmm. his, his encyclopedia of religion is very friendly to th this idea of, of supreme God in, in, in primitive cultures. Rudolf Otto, uh, Durkheim, they all have, it seems to me that they have, they're insightful, they have some good things to say, um, yet Schmidt and yourself both kind of rake them over the coals for, for their negligence in, in, in dealing with the high God hypothesis. Uh, yeah, and by the way, I, I appreciate Otto and Iliade, uh, you started out with Radin. Uh, I don't understand where he came from in his really bizarre critique of Schmidt. Uh, Schmidt used his writings as evidence for the Supreme God in some California uh, native tribes. Around the Yosemite Valley, I believe. It looked yeah. Like and uh, it seemed that Schmidt, uh, that Radin would have been more open to the idea of uh, monotheism, but then something happened, I guess, and uh, he took uh, Schmidt's The Origin and Growth of Religion and took a few paragraphs out of that and just wrote a really nasty review of Schmidt on that. 
And uh, then he, uh, he had his own theory uh, based on some Freudian uh, influences that, uh, that uh, religion started with a trickster and so forth. Okay. Coyote. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. are, are you familiar with Chesterton's Everlasting Man? No. Oh, okay. I think you'd probably enjoy it. It's uh, Undoubtedly. Can I comment on the other people that you mentioned? Sorry? Can I comment on the other people that oh, you Oh, sure, mentioned? sure. Yeah. Uh, Iliada, I admire in many ways, as a writer at least. Uh, I've just once again delved into his book on yoga, and uh, I think his idea of hierophanies have a lot going for themselves. But when it comes to the origin of religion, he winds up uh, talking about his uh, categorical forms, the, the mythological past and so forth. And he just uh, does not acknowledge a really a beginning in time for the worship of God. Uh, Otto had his theory of, uh, uh, of a subjective side to religion, which is very good, but uh, he commented directly on Lang and said, here we have an anticipation of monotheism as it's going to show up eventually. And, uh, who was the fourth? Was that Durkheim? Well, Durkheim, you are a little bit more complete in your negation of his, his theories. You well, think basically you no got everything, everything he, wrong. Again, I have no idea where he got his ideas from. But you do, you do say that he is honest about describing some of the raw data in terms of the high god in Australia. Yeah, uh, but <laughs> but there's no warrant for his 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 theory of how religion evolved, as far as you're concerned. Yeah. It seems that that would seem to be your point. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, Chesterton, um, I think Chesterton. I'm sure, I'm confident actually that Chesterton had read Andrew Lang's The Making of Religion, mm -hmm. uh, and he he describes religion in a very interesting way as basically four elements. Not We shouldn't talk about Buddhism, Hinduism, Islam, and, and whatnot. We should talk about four elements that you find. Uh, God, the gods, uh, the philosophers, and the demons. Those are his four categories. Hmm. And he doesn't, you know, categorize or divide or, or according to traditional religions, but according to these elements that you find around the world. He actually kind of misquotes Lang at one point, which is one, one reason that I know that he got his information from Lang. Um, let's see. So I guess the question in terms of all these different thinkers goes, and this is something that Chesterton really picks up on. Primitive man in some ways may not be so different from us. Uh, and, and as religion evolves from this awareness of God, which I think the Bible already prepares us to to find people are have their we we develop our idols too and we want to worship those idols and those idols might be might have the names of a particular theory of, of how religion evolved or something like that mm. uh, do you do you see things uh do you see a continuity between how the notion the belief in, in god in primitive society was lost as society developed with some of these ideologies and theories that, that anthropologists and other professional scholars of religion come up with. Uh, Is hey, that question question too complicated in the way well, I put it? <laughs> let, me, let me put it this way. Belief in one God who is in heaven, who does not require food or drink, who may or may not respond to your prayers. There's not a whole lot of cash value in that. Exactly. <laughs> Belief in the spirits or gods in whatever form. If your child is sick 
and the shaman says, I can heal your child. Uh, give me a chicken and I will do my magic about him. That keeps the economy going. Hmm. And uh, then, and that's, uh, and that's very much Stark's point when he talks about uh, societies like Egypt or Sumer uh, having the, the the gods, you know, palace and the king's palace being up on a high plat on a higher area mm -hmm. above the city. So the god and the and the king are kind of combined. They're they're the one. They're one company basically yeah i think that's really important to understand uh what happened in egypt when uh can't think of his name now uh the worshiper of the one god yeah supposedly installed uh, monotheism into egyptian culture mm -hmm. Now, that doesn't mean that he expected every Egyptian to worship Aten, the uh, sun disk. But it meant that he was the uh, representative or incarnation of the one God, and everybody would worship him. And then he was uh, in his divine person was Aten. And so he wasn't trying to institute a social monotheism, except in the sense of everybody should worship him. There were different uh, sanctuaries for different gods and uh, he didn't want those. He only wanted to be the center of worship. So when one says that he was not uh, successful in spreading monotheism. He didn't try. He, it was not the, the way that we think of, say, Jewish monotheism, where every person is required to worship God. But the common people are supposed to worship him. And then he has the direct connection to the God. Well, in Egypt, of course, you can go maybe even a little further back to uh, Sumer, and you have three chief gods. Apparently, An was the, I don't know if he would be considered the, 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 the original uh, sky god or whatever else. How do, you, how do you see that? Do you see any trace of monotheism in some of the earliest records from Sumer or any, you know, any, any hint or, or, or ruin of that, of, of that concept in the earliest human civilization? Okay, I don't know about Sumer. Uh, the, uh, it certainly looks as though, uh, just as in the Indo-European uh, uh, cultures, uh, some of the, uh, the Semitic cultures also have the same kind of background, just like Zeus and Dios Peter and Jupiter and so forth seem to be a remnant. We seem to have the same kind of thing in uh, the ancient Semitic uh, religions such as uh, Baal, the, uh, if I remember correctly, the son of El and the, uh, the term El or various versions of it. Elohim goes right through into Allah in uh, Islam. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's really intriguing when you, you read Genesis through chapter 11, and there's only one God. And then you have the call of Abraham and by that time, there's a massive amount of gods. There's one right. pantheon, and uh, a, uh, Abraham's family apparently worshipped the moon god, maybe under the name of Sin. And then he, of course, 
left that culture and uh, worshipped the God who was not yet known as uh, Yahweh, but uh, he worshipped the one God, and then he met the king of Jerusalem at the time, and he was apparently a monotheist. So, um, so we have we have all of that period. We have cities, civilization, the human race is basically a few of them are shut up in cities, but most of them are nomadic or maybe finding some little place to live. Uh, and then you have this this uh, what's the what's the word dialectic oh, between okay. the urban and the rural peoples and and the, the cities get conquered after a while and then the new group of people mm -hmm. sets up how do you maybe it's more the philosophical side or even theological um thousands of years in which the egyptians basically didn't know god or the sumerians didn't know the supreme god or at least the records that we have that have come down to us don't show that maybe the common people did why didn't god speak to them in your view or did he speak to them somehow and they were somehow too busy with their idols and just didn't hear him? I don't know whether he did speak to any people there or not, uh, but uh, he speaks to all human beings through general revelation, going back to Romans, that uh, what can be known about him, about God, uh, can be seen in creation, but the people decided to worship the creation rather than the creator. Uh, I can't uh, account, I mean, theologically speaking, I can't account for the uh, anthropology, except to say they fell away from God, from the one God, because for various reasons, emotionally, spiritually, pragmatically, uh, economically, politically, politically, definitely, yeah. Uh, they just found it more congenial to deny God and go after various uh, pagan uh, gods and idols and so forth. I mean, it's mind-boggling when you read uh, in the Old Testament, you have kings that are well off, uh, living by God's law. God gives them success. And next thing you know, they wind up worshiping some other god sounds kind and, of familiar <laughs> uh, sounds like the history of america right now well yeah uh, so, so uh interesting to me though is that you have you're talking about some primitive notions of the supreme god in the greek language uh but then you get plato and you get timaeus and you get the Stoics, mm -hmm. uh, you get Cleanthes, the hymn to Zeus and places like that, where all of a sudden very serious thinkers in, in, among the Greeks are saying, well, maybe this Homer's idea or Hesiod's idea of all these gods flitting around from, from uh, down from uh, Mount, uh, Mount, what's his name? Mount Arab? Well, Mount what is Arab? this? The, the, Greek, the Greek home of the gods. I'm, I'm, I'm drawing yeah. a blank at the moment. Maybe that's not a very way, a very good way to understand life. Maybe it's too complicated. Maybe these gods are too trivial for a serious thinkers. Uh -huh. So here you have, I don't know if you would call this revelation or whether it's the process of people thinking about the world and trying to understand how it, you know, general revelation or specific revelation. But all of a sudden, it's very interesting to me that the Greeks redeveloped the idea of God just in time for St. Paul to come to uh, Mars Hill and start talking mm -hmm. about him. Yeah, I wouldn't call it revelation, but uh, certainly a 
a rethinking, but then uh, a heavy, heavy dose of agnosticism too. Like you say, the unknown God. Socrates, on I think more than one occasion, was asked what he believed. Did he believe in the gods? Uh, too complicated. So did he think that the, the myths were actually originally uh, just uh, stories about what happened to someone and then they were exaggerated? And his response was, uh, if we start doing that, we're going to spend all of our time discussing trivialities, but we need to know ourselves. And so for him, you know, there may have been spiritual realities, but he really didn't want to deal with them. And well, he does. There are a couple of passages in Plato, both in the Republic and in another one of the dialogues where he does, Socrates does seem to suggest that the, the way children were being treated, taught about the gods or God was, was one of the reasons that he was, you know, willing to die because he just, he thought yeah. Hesiod and Homer were, were trivializing the concept of the divine. Mm -hmm. Okay. Last subject I wanted to touch on, and I do appreciate your, uh, spending time with me on this is, is, uh, theories. This is kind of my field. I, I, I did my doc dis dissertation on, uh, trying to develop a model of, of religions, Christian model of religions. Mm -hmm. And usually they're categorized. I think there's a very poor categorization into uh, pluralism, inclusivism, and exclusivism. Mm -hmm. uh, I've already kind of given the game away, given my opinion. Well, what do you think about this, these, these categories well, from a uh, Christian point of view? For, uh, they are helpful to start thinking about these things, but in the end, it doesn't work out. I'm sorry, I have a problem with my mouth running dry. Oh, um, I'm, I'm... Ultimately, everybody is an exclusivist. Everybody believes that what they believe is true. I mean, that's just part of human nature. So, uh, Inclusivists are committed to their religion being true. And uh, you have other people who don't share your religious terms, but at least uh, they don't recognize it. But actually, what you believe applies to them as well. Thinking, of, for example, of Carl Rahner's anonymous Christian. And yeah, that's a to, <laughs> seems a little bit arrogant, but yeah, that particular yeah. formulation of it. Yeah, I talked about that with a group of Hindus, uh, and uh, after a while, they had me down as an anonymous Hindu, which <laughs> which was not right either. So inclusivism is uh, really kind of an imperialism, and I think that implies applies. Well, that to, that particular form of inclusivism, anyway. Not everybody does that exactly. Yeah, I mean they're, they're variations. And jo John Hick has been accused of a, a, a imperialism as well for his pluralistic point of view. Yeah, and I was about to say, then there are people like John Hick who claim to be pluralists, but only at the expense of uh, pushing aside what people actually think they believe. I mean, you and I and uh, everyone else think they believe some very specific things about our religion, such as Jesus died on the cross for us and by faith in him, we are saved. And John Hick would say, yeah, that's nice, but I know what's really going on. You are encountering reality with a capital R. The real. And the same thing goes for Hindus, Buddhists, 
and so forth, he knows better than any of the rest of us what we are really doing when we worship whom we think we worship. And uh, in fact, in an um, anthology devoted to his views, among others, somebody says, uh, well, if you still think in your particularist Christian terms, you should abandon them. And we should start thinking in terms of the real uh, as the true object of worship, which is kind of difficult because the real is, of course, beyond words and rational categories. So, uh, the, the problem that I have a couple problems with so called exclusivism. Um, one is that it doesn't seem to actually exclude, uh, it seems like a very misleading term because if the focus is on truth, not on salvation, exclusivism doesn't necessarily exclude truth in other traditions. That is absolutely right, yes. And, mm -hmm. and, and secondly, it doesn't really, it's not really a model of religions in any sense. As you said, everybody, if everybody has superpowers, then nobody has superpowers. Uh, so do you, do you have a more developed model or picture? I don't, but maybe that's too broad a question. Um, yeah. I ha how would you um, categorize your own, your own perspective on, in relationship to these three? Is Christianity true? Yes. Christianity makes exclusive truth claims. Are other religions true? Looking at the belief system as a whole, this is not possible. Do other religions contain truth? Yes, of course. Does Christianity save? Of course not. Human beings are saved by God. Uh, do other religions save? Uh, no. Do other religions contribute to salvation? Well, yes. Uh, sounds sounds so, like Leslie, Leslie Nubigen. He, he well, said no. <laughs> I, well, in some ways, Leslie Nubian had a, or has a problem with his definition of truth. Uh, but, uh, so uh, that's, that's a better outline of my model. Yes, uh -huh. I do make the distinction between whether a religion is true or contains truth and what that has to do with salvation. Uh, well, what I did in my doctoral dissertation was I developed a model, a Christian model of religions, uh, which I call fulfillment theology, but uh, it's not the same exactly as Farquhar's fulfillment theology because I don't emphasize evolution as he mm -hmm. does. And, and also because it is, in the 19th century, they were uh, not only fixated on evolution, but they're also kind of, well, imperialist. I mean, in those days, Christianity was European, and today it's not mm -hmm. European. Uh, so I, I, anyway, I developed a, a different model of religion, but I think it's a, it has roots in the in the Bible, roots in, in the Christianity. I think it has roots in Christian tradition. I'd be Probably not time to describe it to you, but I'd really be interested in knowing what you think of it. Maybe, maybe we can, uh, I, I can, I can explain it to you sometime, and maybe you can tell me what you think. Sure. It has a few different moving parts, and it'd probably be mm -hmm. too much to try to try to go on that in the end. Anyway, um, we've been talking for quite a while, and I really appreciate your your uh, sharing what you've Thank discovered you. and learned. And I, I love, I love the book uh, in the beginning. God, it's it's sometimes witty, and uh, it's it's often it's extremely insightful. And the, one of the things that really struck me in reading it is being a China scholar myself. Uh, it was very rare for me to read anybody who's outside of the field or even inside the field who gets China right. <laughs> Thank you. That so, is a real compliment. It's it's 
it's kind of my way of testing a, a, a writer. If they, when they start oh. talking about something, I know something about. Do they get that right or not? And and uh, you <laughs> passed very well on that on that score. And, and I I highly mm -hmm. recommend your book. That, that is a a real compliment. I really appreciate that. So thank you very much. Well, thank for, you. It's been participating fun. in this conversation. Uh, thank you for having me on. And I trust the Lord will bless this new enterprise. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye. In broadcast.